Ruiz. Funkateers, Bootsy here to bring the Truth and Rhythm family's attention to Funk Not Fight. Yeah, this is a call to action. We spread hope, not hate, uh, to gain satisfaction throughout our communities via the music uplifting unity. Uh, Peppermint Patty, tell us a little more. Thinker is our partner. Thinker music, that is. So please check the link that's scrolling across the bottom, click it, and submit your music. Let's all funk, funk not, not fight. fight. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. Brought to you by funkinstuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. G.X. Goldfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth in Rhythm Mothership funk bassist Donald Payne, also known as Stump Daddy. As a member of the Crowd Pleasers, he appeared on that group's lone self-titled 1979 album. He also played with funk legend and Westbound Records label mate Junie Morrison on records such as Suzy Super Grippy, and the recently unearthed and revelatory Live at Dooley's 1975. His other credits include P-Funk Offshoot, Glenn, um, P-Funk Offshoot and Glenn Goyne's protege band Quasar's self-titled uh, studio LP. And lately he has been working again with former Quasar member Daryl Dixon and the Chop Horns, as well as Lakeside Stephen Shockley and Fazo's Keith Harrison on new music planned to be released soon. Don, man, how are you? Thank you for joining the show. I'm doing fine. Scott, how are you? Doing good, man. Where are you today? I'm in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. All right. Where and I am. Yeah. So how's uh, the winter weather looking for you? Well, today it's very cold. And uh, when I looked outside, then I saw a little snow on my truck. And uh, I got a, a gig later on this evening. Uh, I'll be going down to Ironton, Ohio. That's like southern Ohio. About an hour away from Charleston, West Virginia. And then, uh, I believe Louisville, Kentucky. 
So I'll be heading down to Orange later on this evening. I got a gig down there. Sounds good. So your gigs uh, nowadays, what's the uh, repertoire like? I just play a lot of clubs and then uh, whatever I can find, you know, do some, you know, some shows somewhere. You know, uh, um, last week I was down in Youngstown. Um, I performed there. Uh, spot down the VFW. I was in Youngstown. That's I used to play in Youngstown years ago, but I ended up getting back somebody through a party, and then they happened to call me. You know, Youngstown, they like a lot of funk. So it just so happened I uh, fit, you know, what I do is uh, I fit better in Youngstown. So I played out in Mount Vernon, Ohio a lot, uh, uh, Charleston, West Virginia, Zanesville. I move around and play in Dayton on and off. They got a spot called Sugars. I do that one. And uh, I pretty much just move around in Columbus. I play a lot of clubs in Columbus. So I just, anywhere I can find something, I'm going to get right there and get it. Get in where I can fit in. Yeah, well, like I say, you know, musicians don't uh, retire. You know, you just keep doing it until, you know, hopefully you can do it until... Uh, you know, uh, until the end, you know, and keep bringing that great music to people. Yeah, I try to keep it happening. You know, I get out there and get to looking and uh, get on the internet and find different uh, jobs, uh, whatever I can find, you know, festivals, anything. You know, I played in Dayton a lot. Uh, I, uh, two years in a row, I did the uh, Funk Fest in Dayton. Uh, last year and this year I got in there. So that was fun. And um, actually in the summertime, I did a lot of festivals everywhere in Ohio. Uh, down in West Virginia, a lot of festivals down there in Charleston. There's, there's a lot of work down in Charleston. And I play down there quite a bit. So I'm going down there for, uh, uh, let's see, I'm going down there New Year's. Down there and party. They, they party down there a lot. I'll be heading down there. I got, matter of fact, I got a gig here in Columbus the day before that, and then the next day I'm heading on down to West Virginia. So they may have some snow there. I don't know. Depends. <laughs> well, Don, uh, how and when did you get the Thump Daddy name? I got that name, uh, yeah, maybe about thirty years ago, and then uh, somebody called me that and. I was playing in a club here in Columbus, and uh, somebody just kept calling me that. So uh, when I decided to, uh, I was working with some bands at the time, and I always liked to thump. And uh, this particular person that started calling me that, and then uh, it's never dawned on me to use that name later on down through the years, to use it as a name I can use for a group, as a group I put together. And so I just remember the name, so I just took that name and just used it. And um, that's how I became uh, using that name. Came from that. He's using that name and incorporate the name into a group. And it's been working for me, so I just stuck with it. Well, go, going back a, a ways, uh, Don, what um, you know drew you to, to music, and, and why the bass? A why the bass? Yeah, why, why, why did you go to the base and uh, you know uh, give us a little bit of your uh, background on how you you know got into music and the base? Well, how I got started on the base. Um, actually, I was playing guitar first, and it was a guy I had uh, came up with. We was about I'll say thirteen, and uh, I stayed on the east side off from Mount Vernon Avenue, and then I met him at. Uh, champion junior high school and and uh come to find out he played bass and uh played guitar so me and him got to talking and i used to catch the bus from the east side to the west side you know with with, with this guitar and this little small amp and uh this one day when i went to his house he had a bass and i had the guitar actually we switched up I said, let me try that. 
and he said he wanted to try what I had. You know, I had a guitar, and that's how I ended up switching. He went to lead guitar, and I went to the bass. He had the bass. I had the guitar. We switched up, and that's how I ended up playing bass, and I liked that better, so I just stuck with it. Uh, a good friend of mine, like Tony Palmore, that I went to school with. And actually, we still playing today. We've been playing ever since we were 14. Wow. We still mm-hmm. play today. More than off, actually. But we actually, we go gig tonight. I go by and pick him up. And uh, we just head on down to Ironton, Ohio. We just played this past Thursday. Um, here in Columbus, uh, played at a club called The Retro. We just did that. And uh, we have played tonight. Who were who some of your so that, biggest? Who were some of your biggest bass influences when you were coming up? Well, I used to listen to. Uh, actually, I listened to everybody. Uh, I always liked it. Uh, Stanley Clark. Uh, listened to Boosie Collins when uh, he was playing with Fucking Deli, and then I stayed up with him. Listened to Larry Graham. I liked his style. Uh, Actually, I I listened to everybody. Um, I listened to mostly a lot of bass players. If I like their tone on their bass, that's what I get into them a lot. If, if their tone attracted me is their tone of their bass. And when I once I listen to it, and that's how I determine uh, I like this guy. I like the like his sound. So I would try to. Uh, I study their sound and then try to emulate that same sound on my bass and, and my amp. I would try to find the right amp, and uh, I see the type of guitars they would have, and then I would try to emulate that 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 same tone. So actually, I just listen to everybody. I listen to a lot of rock bass players, and uh, listen to when they used to use a lot of effects on the bass in the seventies. And so I just and what they do, I just try to incorporate that sound in what I do. I just listen to everybody. Anybody yep. got a tone or I'm gonna I'm gonna try to I'm gonna learn that. What was the um first person you saw perform in person that just really blew you away playing bass? I was uh where was I at? This is, uh, I've seen the bass player to play with, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire's bass player. Verdine? Verdine. I've seen him. Uh, matter of fact, Earth, Wind, and Fire was in Columbus. I've seen him. Matter of fact, me and, uh, the guitar player, Tony Palmer, went to go see them when we were young. When we was about 14 or 15, we went to, uh, down in Veterans Memorial, saw, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. That's the first time I would saw Verdine. I was amazed. Then I went out and got a bass, that same type of bass he had. And I had to get one because I liked that tone that it had and uh, I liked the way it looked and liked the way it sounds. So uh, I don't know what happened to that bass. I think somebody stole it from him. But I had bought one just like it. It was a Telecaster bass. That was my first Fender, and uh, somebody stole that from me. I don't know how they got it, but they got it from me. So he was the first one that I was amazed. And the uh, second bass player that I saw was, um, I was in Zanesville, Ohio. And I seen uh, Boosie Collins for the first time. and seen him on TV. It was, I think it was on Soul Train or something like that. When he had on red and white, I was amazed at that. <laughs> the way he looked and, and, and that tone he had, that, that sound, I was amazed when I saw that. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's what I want to do. Well, Ver- Verdine is so high energy, and then Bootsy's got, you know, so many effects going on. Yeah, I like that. But the tones that Bootsy got, that's what got me them tones. He got the excellent tones, tremendous tones, because I, I studied that and listened to, um, like, on every record that he played on that, I can identify it. I said, that's him playing that. Them tones he got, and with those effects. 
And then also, he's not far away, you know, in Ohio. Oh, yeah. Right there in Cincinnati. Uh, after all those years, I finally met up with him. I think we, uh, it was a guy from Cincinnati named, um, a good child player named Wilbur Longmire. He was in Columbus. And it was a friend of mine who was playing at this uh, nightclub downtown. So they told me to come down there. So um, I didn't know for sure if I wanted to go. It was like in the middle of the week. So I went on down there anyway. Some guys I went to school with. Uh, one guy played keys. I uh, went to school with. Uh, we used to play in a band. Another guy played drums. And um, they said, uh, you know you know Wilbur Longmire? I said, Wilbur Longmire? I said, who is that? They said, you don't know him? I said, no, I don't know him. I had no idea who he was. And um, so they told me to, you know, to set in so he can, he, I, so he can hear me. So I got up there and went on and played and, and um, we was doing some jazz. So the dude kept watching me and I said, uh, well, I went to myself, I said, why does dude keep looking at me? I said, I must have did something wrong. But I had already been, I had been doing a lot of drinking that night anyway, so I said I must have made a mistake. I said maybe he don't like mistakes. I said no, I couldn't have made no mistake. And he just kept looking at me. Then he came over to me after we finished. He came over to me. He asked me. He said, "How would you like to, uh, you know, play with me and record this uh, album?" I said, "Well, I'm not really a jazz player, man. I, said, I like playing funk." I said, "These guys I went to school with. They told me to come down here and." Uh, he said, no, nah, man, you can, you, can, you can play some jazz. I said, no, nah, I'm not a jazz player. He said, I want you anyway. So I said, okay. I said, well, give me your phone number. Gave me his phone number. And um, I called him. He said, I'm going to record my album at Boot's house. I said, Boot? I said, Boot, who is that? He said, man, that's Boosie Collins. I said, man, you don't know no Boosie Collins, man. He said, yes, I do. He said, I raised him. I said, you got to be kidding me. So I thought he was joking. So I called him back, and he, he said, well, I'm not ready for you. I called him the next week, because I, I got anxious now. I said, uh, Boosie Collins, so he said he was doing it at his house. So um, I didn't believe him. Called him again. He said, well, come on down. I came on down there, and I said, well, where, where, where Boosie at? He said, we going, just hold on, just hold on. So he said, just sit right here. We was at his house. I got up, baby, like around 7 o'clock in the morning, man. Harry Hill got down to Cincinnati. I said, I'm going to meet this guy. And uh, went down there and stayed at Wilbur's house all day. And I said, oh, man, I want to be jiving. Later on that day, I couldn't believe it. He said, let's get ready to go to Boosie's house. I couldn't believe it. So we got to Boosie's house. It was his um uh, Went inside. I couldn't believe I was there. Got to his house, and uh, it was his brother, Catfish. When we came inside, Catfish was standing in the kitchen. I said, uh, "How you doing, Boosie?" <laughs> Catfish looked at me. He said, "Man, I'm not Boosie. Boosie downstairs." And I thought it was Catfish. Boosie because it kind of looked so much alike. I said, "Dad, Boosie must cut all his hair off," and I thought it was him. I remember seeing his wife when I came in. I think she was. Making a cake. So I went on fast. I said, well, where he at? He said, he's downstairs in the basement. He said, go on down there. And I went down in the basement. I didn't even see him. And I came back up. I said, well, where he at? He said, he went to a secret passageway and went up to his room. So I never did get to see him. I was in his house, but I never did get a chance to see him while I was in his house. So they was having this party. They said, well, just, uh, well, you come to the party late on the night. So I, it was a relative. Um, uh, there's a hat, guy had a nightclub and said, well, Boosie would be there. So I had been uh, been there since 8 o'clock in the morning. Here it was, maybe like around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. i have been down there all day. I, you know, I stayed up. I wasn't giving up until I met him. Finally, I, when I went to the club, I said, well, what time is he coming? They said, he'd be here. It's just have patience. He'd be here. By the time he got there, it was, I think it was maybe like uh, it had to have been after 
midnight when he got there. I had stayed up all morning, all day just to meet this guy. I stayed up and then finally he came through. And I was shocked when I met him. As soon as he came through the door, I mean, he had on this outfit, man. I thought he was getting ready to play. He had on the outfit like he was already, he was taking it to the stage. By the time when I ran up there to him, a lot of guys that were in the club, they ran up. I guess they was going to see what I was going to do. It was like bodyguards. I was, I was so happy to see him. They said, well, go ahead and take a picture. Well, I took, I re- t- took a picture. My camera broke down. I was disgusted. They said, go, go out and buy another one. I said, I'm not going to do that. He might leave. They said, he ain't going nowhere. He'll be here when you get back. So I, I wouldn't even leave. I just stayed there and just kept talking to him. Just kept talking. I was so glad to meet him because I had never seen him before after all the years that went by and didn't realize that he lived in Cincinnati. You know, it's not that far from Columbus, maybe about two hours away. And then I sit there and talk to him for the longest, but I couldn't take no pictures. My camera broke. <laughs> so we talked. For a long time, and I, I was glad to meet this guy because I'd never seen him before, never other than on TV. And then uh, I went to his house, but I didn't get to see him. But I, he came to the party. We talked. We talked for a long time. So after that, and then um, what what we year about do you, what year about do you think that was? Beg your pardon. What year about do you think that was that you? Met him. Oh, when I and that was like around uh, ninety eight. That was the first time I ever seen him in ninety eight in person. That was nineteen ninety eight. I never seen him perform in person. I just seen him on TV in seventy six, but I never seen him live. And then later on, after the years, he had came to Columbus and uh, by me, I I used to play in so many bars. I never had a chance to really go out to see anybody because. I stayed so busy because I played with so many groups, you know, that's how I was getting my money. I'm playing, I'm going from band to band, band to band. I'm playing with everybody, rock bands, funk bands, anything I get, jazz bands, anything I get my hands on. So people was was always calling me. So actually I never got a chance to see other groups, you know, because I was always playing. So by the time I decided I want to see somebody, I already had a gig. So that came to that house. So I couldn't even see nobody. But, uh, well, how how did you uh, how and when did you first meet Junie? I met Junie when I graduated. Uh, graduated in nineteen seventy five, and um, I didn't know what I was going to do when I got out of school because I just barely made it out. Flunk the year before, and I supposed to have went with a group uh, from Columbus it was called the uh, Souls of Purge at that time, and then when they got out there, they drove all the way out there. And um, they got a deal. Got hooked up with, uh, um, I don't forget the name, who they got hooked up, but they changed their name to uh, Night Trouble anyway. But they asked me to still come out there. I said, man, I can't come. I got to finish up. I got to at least try to graduate, man. They said, man, come on out there and finish up school. I said, man, you know I ain't going to finish up no school out there. They go. I knew how they were. They was always partying. So I said, I just, I might have to stay. So 1975 came around next year, I made it out. And then there was a guy that Craig Moreland was a good friend of mine as a play guitar, real good, real good and funky. Um, he uh, seen me walking. I had my bass and I was coming from a club and he seen me walking. He said, man, where you going, man? I said, I'm on my way home. So I uh, just came from a jam session. I said, I'm on my way home. So he said, uh, how would you like to, uh, play with the crowd pieces. I said, yeah, I'll play with them. Cause I didn't know what I was going to do when I was graduating. Just so happened. Uh, I joined the crowd pieces. Two weeks after I graduated, this was like in June. All of a sudden we meet, uh, Junie Morrison, you know, of all people. And I just happened to be in the group, just got in the group. And two weeks after I graduate, he comes through. So I see him for the first time. And and um, to me, he didn't really look like a musician. He looked more like a uh, a businessman, like he owned a big corporate office. So I'm looking at him. I said, God, I thought he just suit this guy I got on. So I was amazed by that. So when he came through, he said he was looking for a band. He had another band that was out of Mansfield. And he was he explained that and said he was working 
with them, but he looked for somebody else to play his material. So uh, after I listened to uh, the bass lines that was uh, was on that album back in 74, but uh, thought when we do, I said, wow, would I be able to play that type of style? You know, because I've listened to the bass lines, not knowing that was him playing the bass. So uh, when we met this guy, when I met him, I was amazed. So I came in at the right time. Um, when he came through, he came to one of our rehearsals. So um, he said he'd be back the next day. He wanted to start rehearsing with us. And this was like in June of 1975. And uh, we started rehearsing. We would rehearse 10 hours a day. And um, he was showing us his material, you know. Uh, actually, he was putting a show together. He was going to see if we was capable of playing it. And uh, I think I was the only one that had it the hardest because it was taking me a long time to catch on to those uh, those particular lines that he was playing. Those it, it was very intricate, so, you know, real jazzy. but. He had more of a, a style on the bass, like he was more like a, a James Jamerson. So it took me a while to try to adapt to that type of feel because what I was listening to, I was listening to more like the Funkadelic style. So I had to change over and try to learn what he wanted me to learn. And it, and it took me a, a minute to adapt, but finally I got it. And then that's when he decided to... Uh, but said, I'm going to use you guys. He said, you guys can play my material. So we, we stayed with him uh, up to 1976. And then we had uh, um, had been playing with him. He had took some, uh, came in on some of the gigs that we had. And then he was said, well, he still has some unfinished gigs with the other group. It was called Junie and I, these guys out of uh, Mansfield. So then he'd come back to us. We would do our show. So when he come in, we'd do what we have practiced with him. Now it, it became Junie's band. So we stayed together. And then he took us into the studio. He said, uh, this was in 1976. He took us to the studio. He said, uh, I really don't need you. But I'm going to let you play anyway because you're good enough to play my material. He said, I'm going to let you uh, record on this album, which is Suzy Super Groovy. So we did like three songs off the album because he can play everything. And uh, he said, uh, I really don't need you. I'm gonna let you play it anyway. He said, you guys, it's good. I said, actually, we was like one of the first ones back then that played on his albums because he played all the instruments himself, but you had to play exactly the way he wanted, the way he felt it. If you couldn't do what he do, he ain't gonna let you play. So I had to, you know, incorporate them bass lines he was showing me. I had to play them exactly the way he would play them, note for note. And that's how I passed the test with him. And he played on me, me and him got pretty close. And then uh, we got into this, uh, got into an accident and that kind of changed everything around. But when we got into this car wreck, um, we decided we was gonna wait on him, but then uh, we went on and got the, got signed to Westbound. And, uh, he wanted us to wait till he got back on his feet. We didn't wait. We went on and uh, got signed. And then he left us and uh, made another, you know, he went another direction. At that time, he went with George Clinton. So this was like around uh, 77. He kind of got back on his feet a little bit. So at that time, I met Glenn Goins around 77. When we got signed, I met Glenn. And, uh, it brought him in. As let, let, right here. Don, I'm going to jump in and interrupt you. So sorry about that. But I want to ask you about a couple of details. Okay. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know, I mean, I've heard about this terrible accident Junie had. Um, can you just give a little detail on what happened so people know? Well, what happened? Well, we, actually, we was riding in a van. We was coming back from Grand Rapids, Michigan. And at that time, uh, Junie said, well, this is the last time uh, uh, that we're going to be off. We got one day off, and you, you got, we're going home, and you're gonna, you got to see your people for you know for a minute after this. You only got one day after that. It's going to be a while before you see them. Miles was just 
kiss him goodbye because we're going to be gone. By that time, his album came out in 76. And he had everything that was already set up for his tours. He normally would fly to where he was going back and forth with us, and then he'd go with the group called I. But this last time he rode with us, he said, I'm officially going to stick with y'all. And so we rode back in his van. So we had been up all night. You know, uh, the band was partying, celebrating, because it was our last time playing these clubs. Until this accident, we got to this terrible accident. So me and Junie was laying in the van. We was laying back in the back. And both of us were asleep. He was right there by the door. I'm in the middle, and they Craig Morland was on my left. I'm in the middle. I'm laying right beside Junie, laying right up on it. Both of us were asleep. We was knocked out. All of a sudden, I heard this hard crash. Didn't know what it was. And uh, kind of woke up. I knew we hit a car from the back, and I was hearing guys screaming, and, and uh, didn't know what to do. Judy was still out. Was, all of a sudden, he kind of woke up, and all of a sudden, I, I seen the van how they went to a, an angle. And we hit this car, bounced off this car, and then uh, it went into an angle. And what happened was, guardrail came inside the van from off the freeway. When we hit, when it went into an angle, it slid, and, it, and when it turned. What I could remember, it uh, I kind of woke up, but I'm still kind of sleepy. Garwell actually came inside the van and went out through the other side of the van. So it hit Junie first. Junie was right there with the Garwell was at. He was right there by the double doors on the side. It hit Junie first, broke both his legs, broke both of mine, and it went out to the other side. So we laying out. I'm leaning over the guardrail. I mean, I'm in so much pain. And, um, uh, I knew I was hollering. I was in so much pain. It was like around in October. It was ice cold. Right. We was up in, uh, I think we was up in coming out of Michigan, going into Ohio. And then we ended up in uh, Lima Memorial Hospital in uh, in Ohio. And uh, I remember hollering and saying, uh, where all my money at? Because that's where it came back. We had just came back from Canada. I had a pocket full of money. But I had it in a small box, and I remember seeing all my money just flying up in the air. And so I was hollering, telling somebody to get my money. I couldn't get it because I was in so much pain, and I couldn't even move. And I looked over and seen Junie, and I remember Junie saying, get my diamonds. You know, he always wore a lot of diamond rings, and he used to tell me to buy, buy one and put on my pinky finger. And uh, I think Craig went over and took his rabbit coat. I mean, coke or something like that, and wrapped it over the top of Junie. It was Junie was laid stretched out. I mean, he was in such pain. I, I could see it in his face. He was hurting bad. So we went to Lima Memorial. They cared as Lima Memorial, and we was in intensive care. They didn't think we was going to come out of it because it was such a terrible accident. Man was total. And uh, we was in Lima Memorial. And we was in intensive care, and uh, I got a call because we was on the opposite side of the room. Junie called me up and told me he was going to be out of there. And he, he said, I'm going back to Dayton, man. He said, I'm going to stay in touch with you. I was still there. So he left, went on back to uh, trans, you know, port him back to Dayton, where he's from. And about a week or two, then I went on back to Columbus. And then um, that was it. And um, how, 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 long did, how long did it take you to fully recover, Don? It took me, i say about a year because I couldn't walk. I was in a body cast, but I came back out anyway because I was trying to save my gig, keep other bass players from taking it. So I came back out in the body cast and, um, and got back with the group because that's all I had as far as uh, means of making money. So the group came back out. They waited on me for a minute. It was some guys or something, but they want they wanted their gig back. So I said, I can't let these guys take this gig. I said, I told the group, I said, I'm coming back. I said, I'm in a body cast. I'm in a cast. I said, I can just barely play. But my thumb, I had a broke, uh, my thumb was broken on my left hand. But some kind of, I managed to, uh, to learn how to play all over again with that broken thumb. And then the tendons inside was messed up. So today I can't even move, but I had learned how to play anyway after that. 
and I, I had lost my base. So I had to end up uh, getting some money from uh, from my grandmother to get another base, and then I, I had to come back to the group. So I remember we played up in Detroit, and uh, I was in Cavs. Matter of fact, I, I believe I got when we got when we got signed. I think I was in the Cavs when we got signed, and that was in '77. Well, Westbound went on and signed it. Wow, that's and, ama- uh, that's it's, it's amazing. What a ordeal. Um, for for people that don't know, Don, what was the uh, history of the crowd pleasers before you joined them? Well, they had been around for a long time. I think they were from West Virginia, Charles, West Virginia, but they had been playing for years. And they had a sister that he used to sing with them at the time. She had left the group sometime, maybe like around 73 or 74, way before I even got with them. I think she got a, a record deal with uh, Delight Records up in New York. And she was an excellent singer. That was, that was their sister uh, of the brothers. Then they had another brother, I believe, who played saxophone. Uh, he had left way before I got there. And then uh, the year that I started, the year before I started, it was a guy that played the trombone uh, I went to school with, uh, Frank Thompson. He had left and joined the Bar Caves. So we never did get the chance to play together in the crowd. Please. He had left the year before and went with them. So it was uh, me with the crowd pieces. I took one of the brothers' place that played bass. I uh, took his place. He had left the band, so I ended up getting in. And next thing I know, two weeks after I graduated, here comes Junie Morrison. That's how we played with Junie. So we only stayed together for maybe like, a, a, you must say, about two years. Were, were you related? Were you, was Delbert Payne a relative of yours? No, he was uh, a good friend that I've been knowing. And then when I first started playing in the clubs when I was 14, I met him coming in the club. And I didn't had no idea who he was, you know. And uh, he had saw me up there playing, setting in. And uh, when he came through, he introduced himself to me. So I, uh, I looked at him. Actually, uh, he played saxophone at the time, Delroy Payne. When I first seen him, I thought he was a pimp. When I first seen him, he had on this jumpsuit with these platforms. This maybe like around seventy, uh, maybe seventy three or something. Yeah, maybe like around seventy three. I didn't know who he was, and then he told me who he was. Next thing I know, uh, he had, he had just joined the crop. He's maybe like a year before I had joined. But he's a, he's a good friend, so we 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 stay in touch, and actually we we still talk every now and then today. And uh, good friend, we just got the same last name. Huh, that's funny. Did did um did you ever see the Ohio players before you met Junie? Never seen them. I, like I said, I was always playing myself. I never seen no groups. Actually, not that many. I, the only group I can remember seeing was. Uh, Earth went far as a kid, but as I got older, man, I played so much. I never had a chance to, to go see a group. I might have seen, might have seen uh, Funkadelics once at the Lashie Building here in Columbus. Uh, they, they, they had been, uh, I think I did see them. I did see them. It was at a time when I didn't have a gig that particular night, but the next night I got know I played somewhere, but I was, I was always playing. I, I, I never really had a chance to, uh, you know, to see that many groups. I, I played a lot. I was always playing. You know, people was always calling me for gigs, so I, I stayed pretty busy. I was pretty much I was making my living. So I would do that instead of go seeing somebody. I, you know, I'd take a gig in a minute. I, I understood. Um, before we uh, uh, talk a little bit more about that crowd pleasers um, and, and the record you guys did, just um, – you know, we know Junie was a multi instrumentalist. We know that he was with Ohio players, he was with Funkadelic, he did his solo records. But having been up close and personal with Junie, is there anything you could share with viewers in terms of, you know, what he was like in terms of his personality and also a little bit about his talent? Well, when he wasn't doing his music, this guy, I would say he was one of, uh, this guy was very nice. One of the nicest guys. And if he liked you, uh, he would do anything for you. I mean, he would help you out. Uh, at that time, he used to uh, 
talked to me a lot, and he he was uh, he knew I came up poor. He knew I ain't had no money. That guy used to give me money all the time. If I need some, all I got to say, I need this, and I would get it from him. He would do anything for. He would help you out. He was one of the nicest guys. I liked him a lot. And a lot of times when we was in the studio, I would be playing something on my bass, just be making up stuff. He said, uh, who is that? I said, what you mean who's that? I said, that's mine. He said, let me have that. And then he might go in his pocket. He'd go in his pocket. He always kept a lot of money. Go in his pocket. He'd pull out about six or $700 just to take that idea. <laughs> but he would do that just to help you out because he knew I didn't have no money. So he just, he, he just, he was a nice guy, and he would help you out. He used to talk to me a lot, and you know, getting it together and how I should look, because he was concerned about your appearance. He always used to tell me how I should dress and what I should wear, make sure you, you, you looking like this. And then I used to look at him how he dressed, and so it's just like <laughs> I had to pattern myself after him back then. And this guy was very neat. Very neat, very particular how he looked. I mean, he did no flaws as none, but he was a, one of the nicest guys, man. I, I never seen, never seen him upset. Never seen him upset. I never seen him upset for for nothing. I mean, as long as you don't make no mistakes, I just never seen him make a mistake. Never, never lost it. I mean, he was one of the nicest guys. I was, uh, we almost hooked back up again. And after all the years went by, he contacted me and asked me what was I doing. And I told him I had put a band together. And then when he asked me, I said, oh, wow. I said, yeah, I'll do this again, but I wasn't in the position to do it. So that's why we didn't come together. I would have done it because he was a nice guy. The guy helped you out. He, he, he got you back. <laughs> I can say that. What was he? What was he like on stage back then in the mid seventies? You know, did he interact with people a lot? Did he kind of like stay behind a keyboard, or what was he like on stage? Very, very, very talkative. He loved talking to people. He's the type of person, man. If he'll say something, then you had to try to figure out where he's coming from. But he gonna he gonna speak his mind. He gonna say what he gonna say. But he loved talking to people because he was very proper when he. Say his uh, pronounce his words. He was very proper to the audience, and then when he played with us, and he loved talking to the people uh, that I can remember when he was when we were together. And uh, it would be a pause, he'd stop, and then he just just get to talking, asking people, you know, how they doing. Uh, um, my name is Junie. He loved to introduce himself, tell people who he is. And, and then uh, how are you going to change the name from the crowd? Please do the June, uh, Junie Schoon Boogie Band. You know, he, he just loved to talk. So we just wait on him after he finished and then uh, watch his hand signals and he get a sign and we go into another song. But when we practice something, he never do the same thing the same way we practice. He'd change it up because everything we do, everything he does, it was mostly like a vibe. So you just really got to tell him, play close attention to what I'm doing. Keep your eyes on me. And then that way you won't make a mistake. But if you drift off, now he might get mad and might say something to you. And uh, now he wouldn't find you if you make a mistake, but uh, he, 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 he'd get on you. But he wasn't a mean guy. He wasn't a mean guy. He was one of the nicest. Were you on that um, 75 recording that just got released at Dooley Show? Yeah. Okay. So. Did you know that there was a recording of it? Yeah, I knew it. Where's it been all this time? <laughs> <laughs> Probably stored away. Wow. Because, I, mean, playing. I mean, I don't think anyone, you know, knew that it was there. It's kind of like a, um, a long lost treasure, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mystery, but uh, it was. Uh, I believe it was uh, it was some more. I think it was some more. Don't it just haven't surfaced yet. Well, what really uh, was curious to me on that show, 
uh, is, you know, that he was doing FOP, which was Ohio Players song that I didn't think he had anything to do with because it was later on with the Ohio Players and then also doing Shaky Ground, the Temptations track. And um, do you have any idea why he chose to do, you know, others material like that? Uh, let's see. I think when, when he heard us, I think we, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I know we was already doing Shaky Ground because the drummer was singing that. And I'm trying to think who in the band was singing Fop. So when we were doing that, he was listening to what we was doing. He would take the songs that we were playing and then he would incorporate that into his show. So we was already doing the songs, I believe. We was already playing the flop. And then he would take it and do an arrangement of it. Also interesting to me is on that recording, you know, there's times where he sounds very similar to Sugarfoot in the way he phrases. And I didn't know that, you know, he could sound similar. So I don't know if Sugarfoot, you know, emulated some of Junie or Junie emulated Sugarfoot or how that went. I don't know. See, I didn't know him at the time, but Junie was good. Uh, he, what, I, what I noticed, he was good with coming up with different voices, emulating different styles of voices. And I used to sit there and watch him do that. He'd come up with these authentic voices, and he would use them a lot on stage, and then he'd use them on his records. But he was good with that, uh, with that different style of uh, authentic type of voices. He, he could, cer- he could certainly do the granny voice. <laughs> yeah, but that's definitely, yeah, that, that's him. Uh, <laughs> like I said, he he was good with that. He he, he was good with that. And then uh, I couldn't do it, but uh, he, he's good with it. Uh, that was just his thing. Well, you know, everyone I've spoken to from like Billy Beck of the Ohio Players to uh, Wes Boatman, who worked with Junie later in the studio, and everyone just yeah. speaks so highly of him and I also heard he had a pretty good sense of humor. Great sense of humor. I mean, uh, guy was very educated. Uh, I, I believe he went to college. I think he may have went to Ohio State. The guy is, is, is really intelligent. Very intelligent. A lot, a lot of people talk about him as being sort of uh, – Prince-like before Prince, you know, the way he was a multi-instrumentalist and did the writing and arranging, composing, everything. Oh, yeah, he was, he was actually, he was ahead of his time. And I didn't know he was that talented until we, uh, when we got into the studio or even in rehearsal, actually in the rehearsal, now he said, give me that bass and take my bass. And I didn't know he can play the way he did. And then when he, when he got in the studio, he was the same way. I mean, he was Superb on the drums. I mean, he's a killer on the drums, man. Bass, lead guitar, keyboards, uh, vocals. I mean, hi, he can do all. He can do all the vocal parts. Um, I mean, the guy's that good. Horn parts. They had to come up with the lines on his keys, so he know all the different harmonies to put, put with the horn parts, and he can just play all that on the keys, and then he show them guys what to play on the horns i mean he just do everything and um like i said before you know he said i really don't need you i can do it all myself which he can he he can do it all as if it sounded like he had a whole complete band that was playing it and be all him you know, can do everything and he, he was good at it from i mean he can cover all the styles he's just that good well what, was Susie Super Groupie your first time, you know, doing a professional recording in a studio? First professional. So that must have been a kick for you, I bet. I mean, were you sort of uh, intimidated at all or feeling like you, you made it or what? I felt like I made it. I was I did something because um, he gave me the opportunity and chance, so I knew I was there. You know, somebody that already wrote hits, you know, which he wrote the first hit was Pain, you know, for our players. And he wrote all the mother songs. I mean, to be working with somebody like that and, and Ohio players just left 
uh, westbound, I think, I believe it's 74, and then you know, we ended up getting in there with him in 76. You know, that was that was amazing. But to be able to record with somebody like that that wrote hits, that, that was, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I can still remember that like it was yesterday. And then I remember it had this uh, one bass in there. And it was a jazz bass. And I remember he explained it to me. He said, this is the way your bass is supposed to feel like that. And the strings on the action numbers real low. And that's when I got into playing my basses like that. I got that from him and stuck with it. But this guy can, was so good on the basses, was, was aesthetic. And I used to sit there and just, and just I'm just amazed just, just watching him play. He'd just be looking at me while he'd just be riffing on that bass, just looking at me. You know, like, can you do what I do? <laughs> Did he use did he use any thumb or just finger picking? He used he used both. He, I mean he was that good. He knew how to switch up, you know, go from thumb to the finger technique. But the way he played, man, it was so smooth and he knew how to hit his notes where everything come out. Everything just come out perfect. And he would show me that. You know, he showed me that type of technique. So, and you took what you learned from that into the uh, sessions for the Crowd Pleasers record? Well, I, at, at, around that time, I had already kind of developed my sound, what I wanted to sound like, but I used a little bit of his technique, but not too much. But by that time, I was developed what I wanted to do, and that, that's pretty much it. I didn't really get to uh, stretch out how I really wanted to play, but uh, they were saying, you know, you don't want me to play like this. Now, if it would have been mine, it, it would have went another direction. But by that time, I was already, well, that was before. By that time, I was developed what I wanted to sound like. So I never really got a chance to express the way I want to be till pretty much till I got on my own. So how do you feel about the crowd pleasers uh you know, debut record, you know, did it come out as you guys had hoped it would? And how'd you feel about, you know, how Westbound handled it? Well, they, uh, they handled it well. It's, um, I didn't think they put enough money behind it because one song could have really did something. I mean, I know it hit in New Orleans. It was number one on the charts. And then uh, it hit in Florida, some part of Florida. I don't know if it was number two or number three, but uh, we never did get a chance to uh, really tour off of it. But we got our first tour off of it when we played down in New Orleans and we played in the stadium. And that was, uh, uh, that was, I believe that was in the, I think that was in the 70s, about 79 or something like that. But uh, after that, we, didn't do too much. Uh, the first time we went out, I think we uh, opened up in front of Sheik in Detroit. We did good on that one, but then when we went, uh, they flew us down south to uh, New Orleans. We did. We opened up in front of uh, Chocolate Milk, uh, uh, Roy Ayers, and and uh, Heatwave. Heatwave was on the show, which was out of the things from Dayton, and it was, it was another group that was on the show but anyway. We didn't do too good on that. So we didn't get a chance. If we did good on that, we went straight to Florida. But I, I guess it works off of how well we do from, you know, every time we do a show, then it leads to another state or another city. So we didn't do too good down in New Orleans. And so that disqualified us. So we never did follow up down in Florida. And then after that, everything just started going downhill. But one thing I can't say about West now, West now did give us a chance to prove ourselves to try to do something. What 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 we song had, what what song off the record was the one that got some play? It was called Freaky People. Oh yeah, the, fir the first the first track. People. Yeah. First cut. And um it was a guy named uh Leroy Emmanuel was uh he, he came up with that idea. And he came in as a songwriter and helped us out and gave us that idea. And I believe it was that one and, a, and another song. 
um, or funk deal, I think that's what it was. And that was it. So that was the only song that really, you know, gave, got us some airplay. We didn't get too much, didn't get no airplay in our hometown. Uh, no, he didn't write funk deal. He wrote CP Funk. That was that was it. My, I apologize on that one. Yeah, those are the two songs that he did. So um, we never did get too much airplay. They didn't uh, put a lot of money into this album. So it just uh, folded. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.